the intro. Um, so this will be quite a different flavor from the previous talk we've had. Um, if you think of bioethical, bioethics considerations, just throw them out the window. Um, so this is, this is the, the crazy future that was dreamed of by crazy futurists and the part that I briefly played in trying to bring some of these things about. Um, luckily for everyone here, most of it didn't really work, so you're all safe. <laughs> Um, but I just want to start with something that's kind of like the public perception of nanomachines. If you just go on to Google Images and do a search, you find these really cool looking images of tiny robots shooting lasers into blood cells, um, a guy who's clearly injected way too much strange things into his body, saying nanomachines, son, like it's the answer to everything. Well, um, not quite. But let's, let's start with something that's maybe a bit relatable. So, regarding issues of strength enhancement or body enhancement. So, how many push-ups can you do in one minute? Let's just do a show of hands. Um, I know it's just at lunch, but who can do at least one push-up per minute? Okay, pretty good. Who can do at least 10 push-ups per minute? Who can do 100 push-ups per minute? Okay, no more. Well, if you could do a thousand push-ups per minute, it would start probably making a sound. So, just, <laughs> just, just, just humor me for a moment. If you, if you would be pumping air at that speed, you would actually be generating sound waves. And you could hear a frequency of it. Um, I would play it for you, but I, I was too lazy to try to embed sound files. But just imagine, for argument's sake, that as you go from a thousand push-ups per minute to a million push-ups per minute, you'd be going somewhere from like, to like, and, and beyond. And you go past the range of human hearing to the range that I would call ultrasonic. So you could quite legitimately say that this is faster than sound in the sense that the frequency at which it was vibrating or oscillating was higher than the maximum range of human hearing. It is not, however, supersonic. The speed does not go beyond that of sound. There is no shockwave or sonic growth. So how is this relevant to anything? Well, partly I just thought it could open up, but also um, you imagine that if you could make something that moves really fast, if you go smaller and lighter, you can go faster. And so you can have nanomachines that work very rapidly and very efficiently. So that's kind of the overarching idea. So how can you make mechanical systems that move very fast? Well, the answer is make them very small. So this kind of comes down to the idea of one man really, for the most part, called K. Eric Drexler. And he did his PhD, I think, in the 80s in, in MIT. It was one of the most unusual because his PhD was basically dreaming up and proposing a program of research that no one had done before. Uh, I think one department completely refused to, to accept him as a student and he had to go to maybe like the arts department. It was, it was quite bizarre. But he published his thesis as a, as a book and kind of elaborated on these ideas that if you had tiny machines that were something like miniature construction cranes moving things about that you could possibly construct and manufacture materials and material items at a very small scale and very quickly. So he, he possibly <coughs> could operate up to megahertz rates, meaning a million times per second, and using an approach that he called mechanochemistry. So instead of relying on conventional chemistry, the activity of molecules and things. He would basically push molecules together mechanically and just force them to react. So that was his, his idea, his conception, which was inspired by Richard Feynman, a famous physicist, who proposed some years earlier in an after dinner talk at the American Physical Society in 1959 that you could one day perhaps arrange the atoms all the way down. So he was imagining atomic scale assembly in a time way before what we know today of like atomic force microscopes and all kinds of technological developments. So it was a very, very prescient talk. Now, while he took a Richard for inspiration, there were other Richards at work. Um, so there was a Richard Smalley, a different Nobel laureate, who won this for his work on buckyballs, the kind of 60 carbon football, tiny football shapes. And he argued that this, was, this vision was basically rubbish, it could never work because you don't have construction cranes at that scale. What you have is something that's just more like a balloon animal, though he didn't use those words. 
you're saying that you have a problem of fat fingers and sticky fingers. You could pick up them, but you couldn't put it down because things stick at such small scales. There was another critic around the same time, uh, 2003, Richard Jones, a professor in the UK, uh, who wrote a book about his own ideas of Drexler's program of nanotechnology and how these things might pan out. And what he thought was that if such things would come to pass, they would not be hard and dry, but they would be more soft and wet. So something like bio-inspired nanomachines. And he has this passage from his book, which I found very interesting, um, that in such a view, manufacturing would become more like brewing than conventional engineering. You would basically program the ingredients, mix them all, wait, and out comes your product, as if by magic. So I call this perhaps a sort of magic cauldron approach. Um, and I can't help but feel that he was possibly taking a bit of a dig at Drexler and saying, like, this is just ridiculous, um, you and your airy fairy magical ideas. And out of the pot you expect to come some sort of a magical GD that, that dances. Well, as it turns out, this is actually not so far from what we have today, as surprising as that might seem. So I just want to explain this magic culture approach a little bit more. It's what goes otherwise by the name programmable self-assembly. So to contrast this with previous approaches that you have for making things at small scales, well, the most conventional one is lithography. Basically, it's writing. You either sculpt things, um, chisel them, hammer them into the ground, and you do this one by one. So it's a serial writing approach, which is very slow, but also quite precise. Because you imagine that you move the pencil, put it down, put it down again, um, so you can have great control, but it's very, very tedious. The kind of opposite end of the spectrum is what we call the bottom-up approach rather than top-down, where you can grow things. So if you plant, say, a whole field of watermelons, you don't have to grow them one by one. They all grow at the same time in parallel. And you can do the same thing at nanoscale. You can even apply some sorts of um, physical templates that would constrain the shape of the growing particle or watermelon to make it grow in a certain way. But there are limits to this approach. So if you want something more sophisticated, for example, if you want to mass produce a watermelon with a smiley face on it, um, or the equivalent nanostructure which I show on the right, how would you do that? So you need a more sophisticated way of encoding instructions into the assembly materials, which is where this idea of programmable assembly comes in. So let's say that you wanted to make a bunch of red balls. Well, one thing that you could do is that you could design them in a way where they each have complementary shapes. So if you would crack them open, they make essentially tiny bits of shell that have shapes which fit together with each other, like a jigsaw puzzle, and they also have magnets in the right places. Well then, if you would just simply shape this box hard enough for long enough, you'd be supplying energy that assembles the system and you could recover the information that was stored inside to begin with. So in this way, you can basically, just by rapidly shaping a box, create the structures that you want. So the final product, you have a number of correctly assembled structures, and usually you have a few that are wrong, but that's fine. So not everything comes out perfect, and there is some error rate that you accept. Another system that you can have is this wireframe structure, which in 2D encodes instructions for forming a 3D structure. So just by the strain that's linked in the joints between these um, parts of struts of the material, it forms a final shape that's in 3D. So this gives us hints that you can do something similar at small scales. And the key here is that we use the biological material, DNA. So it turns out that DNA is perfect for our purposes because DNA allows you to choose um, exactly how it assembles. The A goes with the T, the G goes with the C. If you design a really long string of A's and T's and G's and C's, like a long sticky string, then you can basically clip it together in a pre-designed way. And each place that you clip it is what we call a staple. You can then force it to connect. If you force enough connections, you can basically create whatever structure you like using these space pair interactions. And so you get some sort of a wireframe topological diagram that we see in 2D. 
but this 2D structure can actually form something in 3D in the same way because each joint has its own strain pulling in a certain way so that the whole structure gets tugged into a desired conformation. So that's DNA origami and that's programmable self-assembly. And I would argue that this is the magic culture. So it was invented in 2006, only three years after Richard Jones' book uh, by a man called Paul Rutherman. And he was building on earlier work by Ned Seaman in the 1980s, uh, widely considered the grandfather or the father of uh, structural DNA nanotechnology. And we use the word structural to distinguish this from genetic nanotechnology. So for example, genetic nanotechnology would involve gene editing or modifying proteins and things like that. It involves using DNA as an information carrier and reading out this information into a meaningful biological context. Structural nanotechnology, on the other hand, simply says, who cares what it says, this is string, and I can stick it to other bits of string and make shapes. So this is the physicist's approach to biological materials. The limitation of this earlier approach was that you could only make quite small structures. So uh, Ned Zeman made a cube of DNA, a structural cube. And he also made tile structures that could assemble over a wide space. However, these were limited either in size or in the requirement of symmetry so that they could tile. The genius of Rutherman's approach was that by bringing in the scaffold strand, this kind of long, malleable piece of DNA, he solved the issue of size, being able to make very large structures, but also of the constraint of repetition. Because if you would simply design the right set of clips, you could clip the same long piece of string into whatever shape you wanted. So in sort of one fell swoop, he solved both of these problems and retain the advantages of the so-called magic cauldron approach, in my words. Which is to say, mix in your ingredients, which are well designed and in the right proportions, heat it up, cook it, cool it down, and you get your structures. So it's kind of like if you try to make a batch of, of meatballs, um, but they just make themselves. You just mix everything, put it in the pot, and then the meatballs form and make all kinds of shapes, dance around. So it's quite amazing. And the first structures that he made in his original paper were these stars and smiley faces. But quite soon after, people were already making things that looked like robots. So this is a, a sort of dancing robot structure, which doesn't do anything, but it does actually look like a dancing robot. So the question then is, well, how do we turn this into an actual robot? But before we go there, I should just give a note on length scales. So just to orient us, the scale of a human hair, the, the width of a human hair, is between 10 to 100 micrometers. So it's a tenth of a millimeter. If you go 10 times smaller than that, you get biological cells. If you go 10 times smaller again, you get visible light between 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the wavelength of light. You go another 10 times smaller, and you get these origami structures. And just above here, not to confuse you, but it's just to show that in nature, DNA also assembles over multiple scales. It spans the length scale from nanometers to micrometers, just naturally, as it bubbles into chromosomes. So this is, in a way, not an unexpected idea. But yes, so two questions. How do you see things that are smaller than light? And how do you make a real working machine out of these action figures? So this slide, those blank at the moment, contains sort of the outline of my PhD project as proposed. And the next slide will show where we got to, so just to orient a little bit. So starting with the DNA origami approach, which you now know about, this creates from the 2D design a 3D structure. So you have, in this case, a plate that has a seam or a hinge, and it folds. Simply put, if you just remove the staples or the clips along one axis, then it can bend. So now you have a structure that can flop. The next thing to do is to give it some sort of a way to controllably move. So this was done in previous work in the group before I arrived. And what they had is they added in a polymer strand called polynipan, which was temperature responsive and basically functions as a way to open and close the structure. So now you've got a flexor arm that can flex. And just to give an analogy, it's basically like you have already the puppet, now you have the strings. So the polymer is the strings that allows you to control the puppet. But at the moment, the 
all you can do is make it dance. So my project was, can you make Pinocchio do work? Like actually sit in the workshop and you know, make himself useful. So what kind of task could Pinocchio perform? Well, one idea was simply, if you can open and close, then you can take two balls and stick them together to make a two ball shape. So the idea was to dimerize nanoparticles, take single nanoparticles, stick them together, create a dumbbell shape, do this over and over again, possibly at very high speeds, because in previous work from the group, they found that this sort of polymer actuation could occur on microsecond timescales. So that would mean that you could potentially reach megahertz, um, so million times per second rate of operations, possibly, eventually. And as the last bit, just sort of an afterthought, while you're at it, might as well look at what's going on, so build a microscope to do that. And that was proposed as kind of the first three months of the project. As it turns out, that became most of the project for like four years. Um, and I didn't end up doing that much of the origami. Uh, but I will just tell you where I got to on, that, on the next slide. So the microscope that I built, I will not talk about the details of the physics. If you like, you can ask in the questions. Uh, but the physics of it basically involves interference. There's a laser. It shines and bounces off things, and they interact, and then you get a signal at the end. That's the physics. Um, in terms of the implementation, it's basically just a laser shining into a microscope, and you look out on it on a camera. Simple enough. What you see in the camera doesn't make much sense, but when you look at the videos, you realize that there is a component that changes and a component that doesn't change. If you take the average by basically sort of averaging a number of uh, over a window of the video, you can find the background signal that doesn't change. If you divide this away, then you find that all that remains is the part that is changing. And that is your particles that are moving around, which you care about. So after this image processing step, what you get basically are videos. So on the top right corner of this composite is the experimental data that I have for a 20 nanometer gold particle. So this is like two, 3,000 times smaller than the width of human hair and it's diffusing, it's moving randomly in a droplet of liquid. So, if you look here, you can see that it's basically moving around. There's this concentric rings image, which is the particle. It's moving left and right, up and down. So it's moving in two dimensions, but it's also moving in the third dimension. So if I just take, for example, a pause it here. Uh, maybe I find a better place to pause it. Okay. So you see here that the center of the image is dark and it's matched in the, the fit. So I use a mathematical model to, to model this image. And if I can do this accurately, you see that when I subtract them away, the signal of the particle is much diminished or has disappeared. And this tells me that I've correctly modeled the position of the particle. So this way I can track the position of the particle in two dimensions and also in three. Because as the particle moves up and down, it changes the contrast in the center. So now here, it's got a bright center, and that means that it's, it's moved in the z direction. So by doing this approach, I can track the movement of a particle that is much smaller than light to a position that's also much smaller than light, tenth of the wavelength of light, and we're operating, this video was taken at a speed of nearly 20,000 frames per second using a high-speed camera. So this is kind of the smaller than light, almost faster than sound aspect of things of this project. So that's great, but this is just single nanoparticles. What about the machines? So it turns out, unfortunately, that it's very difficult to see the DNA origami structures in water natively. And to resort to we ended up resorting to putting nanoparticles on them. So put shiny bits of gold on the origami nano machines so that you could see them. Because Otherwise, you can't see the origami at all. All you see really are the two gold particles that are stuck on it. So, towards the end of my PhD, this is about as far as I got. So, I had structures where I had two particles on them, and you can see in the microscope image the pairs of particles that are stuck on the surface, and these don't otherwise happen by chance, so we're pretty sure that these come from the structures that we designed. But to actually make this into a nanomachine, um, you would need to firstly introduce a flexible hinge again, put in the polynomial polymer, and probably do a lot more work. So I feel like the stage that I reached would probably be perfect for the next PhD student to do the actual job. So that, that's where I got to. Um, 
thanks for your attention. Just acknowledging the people who are involved in the work. Uh, my two PhD supervisors in the middle and the postdoc staff of the project. Um, yeah. And as a sort of final thing, uh, just thought I would plug the improv show that I'm playing at tonight. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in free, we're at the boathouse from 8 pm. We have a guest scientist. We do fun stuff. Yeah, anyway, that's all. Thank you.